Okay, it looks like we are live on Facebook, and thank you for joining me, Dr. Kaveka. And I would love to, um, I want to hear your story about first, like how you got interested in medicine. I always love people's stories, but I also want to know about your new book, and we'll talk a lot about that. Before I do, I'm going to um, find your bio I have here. I want to <laughs> make an introduction. Um, well, maybe I'll just wing it. I can't find it quickly. Oh, yeah, just wing it. <laughs> well, we could talk about it. I'm happy to share. Yeah, I would love you, for you to share again in your story a little bit about how you, um, but Dr. Gebecca is just, um, she's also known as the girlfriend doc. And I love that because it really um, gives the essence of the fact that you are so authentic and personable. And I know um, both of us live by even a, you know, a higher level of, of uh, higher power and kind of this integrity in our practices and alignment with who we are. And I love, I remember us, we've met many, many times and been on all kinds of the same stages and conferences and different things. But I remember specifically Bo Eason's event um, when we talked about um, your performance um, and, and speaking and we were talking about story power and just there connecting with you and your daughter. And that was so fun. Was that like a year and a half ago? I think so. Close to two years ago yeah. now. And I'm curious, did that impact um, your speaking and your story, just kind of helping to align? Because for me, it really gave clarity to that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think, too, sharing my story and then sharing it with power, right? Instead of being, you know, like all the emotions and feelings that come with it, but stepping into the power of our story and being able to share it boldly because recognizing everyone has a story and that if our story helps heal someone else, that it, that's the power in it. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but years ago, I remember when I first put my story on my website, I was terrified because we just talked oh, yeah. before we go out live, we're both introverts. And like, I kind of wanted, I wanted to keep private, right? But what I found is as I share my story, and that was the first step 10 years ago, now I'm really used to sharing story, but it's the connective tissue. And that's Bo's words, right? It's like how we connect to people. Because when people hear our story, it really mirrors where they're at. It's not really about us anyway. But if we can be authentic and kind of show up with, hey, this is where I've been. This is where I'm going. This is why I do what I do. And it relates to our own story. I tend to, I mean, it's just so beautiful, the magic that happens because people can see themselves in, in our stories and relate a little bit easier um, to us. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, when, too, with our stories, as we, as we talk about what, what happens in our life, what we go through, and, and just that sense of, you know, like, even just the concept of who even wants to hear about our story, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then recognizing that it does touch so many. That's really, that's really powerful. Yeah. Speaking of story, I want to go way back. How did you get interested in medicine? Tell us just a little bit about how you got to where you're at and what drove you into this field. Well, I have always wanted to be a doctor, Jill. I really have. And I, as a, at a young age, let me get that off. The oh, hold on one here. Sure. All good. I can hear you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Don't worry. That me? happens to me all the time. <laughs> I'm like, okay, wait, <laughs> let me share this. And um, yeah, I messed up there. All right. So, um, but when we talk about our story, when we talk about what, you know, has been personal journey to us, it, that does leave some vulnerability. But what I really wanted to share is that just at an early age, I was six when I decided I wanted to be wow. a doctor. I knew I wanted to be, I, the truth is I wanted to be a, either a physician, a nun, or a ballerina, or all three. I right? love it. <laughs> all three. And so I was joked by default, I became a physician. <laughs> oh, I love it. So, physician yeah. on, uh, what was this middle one? A physician, a ballerina, and a nun. Oh my goodness, I love it. <laughs> it's like this creative yeah. and medical science and then spiritual. I love it. It's like the well, think and, and two, what I recognize now, just thinking of the Trinity, right? The the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, like the ballerina is that fun loving spirit. And you know, then there's the spiritual side, there's the nun, and then there's the very grounded side that here and now as the physician. So it is kind of like very cool to look at the three, the dimensions dimensional, the energetic dimensions of that, of that, of that, the, that triad, that trinity. So um, I, and that brings to state where I am now. It's like spiritual life is really important. Mm -hmm. Play fun is incredibly important. And just the, the physician side, the realist, the, the yeah. healer, the, the medicine, you know, woman that I am. And 
um, how that's an important part of who I am too. So all three are very, very I love, important. thank you for sharing that. Cause I know a lot of my people who listen here, you know, they're, I talk about my faith all the time. And so they're used to that uh, and they know there's no judgment. Um, I just bring who I am to the table, but, um, I love that because it really, um, I think that's why you and I connected deeply quickly because I always feel like I can see people at a soul level and can really read um, higher purpose and intent. And I know just, I've always felt this beautiful warmth and sense of purpose that you have and that you bring. And again, it's part of your being the girlfriend doctor. It's that connection to people and humanity and really, truly, I mean, we do medicine, but I'm always like, I'm always joking. It's almost like a front for a greater cause. And the greater cause is like bringing hope and bringing healing and bringing like this, this realm of people, you know, whether they're looking for, um, a purpose or they're trying to get their health back, but it kind of all dovetails in. So it really is important that we bring that sense of holding space for where people are at so that they can bring them themselves wherever they're at, because that's all part of healing, isn't it? It is so much a part of healing, you know, and it's that sense of, of who we are, what we know to be true, mm -hmm. what we feel to be true, what we believe to be true. And that is what is going to help us heal. And we talk about the placebo effect as well as the nocebo effect, right? Yeah. So we have that, that placebo effect. If we think that it is going to help us, it will likely help us. And if we think it's going to hurt us, it will likely hurt us. And so hence the fear around coronavirus and virus viruses in general and quarantine and maybe even other people, if we, if we focus in that way, it's going to work against us versus if we focus on the positive, how great connection is for the immune system, how it increases oxytocin, how it empowers us, then that is a medicinal positive versus a, we've turned a negative into a positive. And I think that's really, um, that's a huge that's a huge shift. And by the way, you know, my daughter and I, when we met you in person in, in Santa Monica, right, we were there yeah. in Santa Monica and she's like, she just has the most beautiful spirit. Oh. So Thank I love you. that you radiate that. <laughs> that means a lot to me. Um, and I love that you mentioned, you know, it's funny because certainly we've had the isolation and we've had this, you know, stay at home and save at home, at least here in Colorado, it's re lifting restrictions a little bit, but we're still following a lot of guidelines and masks and stuff, which is perfectly appropriate. But one of my thoughts through this has been like, where are we, why are we not taking into account the effects on the immune system of social isolation? Yes. You know, the young children that are, this is going to be a trauma for a lot, a lot of children, adults too, right? But like all of these things that we're not thinking about um, and of course the economy. And so I like to think bigger and I'm not against anything that's happened and I've taken it all seriously, but I love that you mentioned oxytocin and connection because think about um, the people who are elderly or um, isolated and they have been isolated for six to eight weeks or longer without touch, without hugs, without, that's a really big deal on the immune system. Don't you think we're, I mean, we just have to take that into account as we uh, expand and, and go back to life as, as normal or as normal as it can be. Yeah. And I think that's an important thing just to check in because we can assume it's not affecting someone just as well as we can assume it is affecting someone. So like checking in is really, really important because like, even with my daughter, I was thinking, oh my gosh, what is, you know, how is this affecting her, her, um, you know, her sixth grade year, her middle school year, she missed her play. She had a great, she was in Fiddler on the Roof. She was the um, uh, matchmaker. So she like had some fun little part there. And like, how is that affecting her? How's it affecting her? She missed, you know, the, all her horse shows were canceled. How is that affecting her? Yeah. And then, you know, just missing her friends. How is that affecting her? And she's like, so far, she's like, nope, I'm fine. It's good. I mean, she's just going with the flow. Okay. And, um, and then each individual, like, and, and, in the changes that I've seen just in my own daughter's life, as well as in, in the team I manage and work with how that there's a, um, you know, you have to, can't just assume that some things. You know, it's so interesting, the same thing with my office, um, they've been troopers and we actually, because we have a retail store and shipping, we actually have gone in the whole entire time. We're medical business, of course, but I, we have had no one coming in and out of the door, like shipments are at the door, no, no one in and no patients in. So it's been all virtual. Um, but what's interesting is I really have seen this real interesting curve where, you know, first panic and fear, and then people kind of like, oh, this is nice to be in our pajamas and, and everything's cool. And then at the end, they're like, I'm so tired of this. And I've 
seen this, like I've had to be a cheerleader and my staff is great, granted, but this is a reality and we're all dealing with changes. And I've noticed, like you said, with your team or checking in, it's I'm, I'm playing a lot bigger role in being present, making sure they're okay. What do you need? Um, do you need a break? You know, whatever things that they need and checking in because it's a whole different experience. And then the stressors because people outside are frustrated or they're overwhelmed or they're sad. I'm curious as to, you know, when you're interact interacting with your staff or your patients, um, how do you deal with the fear? Because the fear is real and it's prevalent out there. Any thoughts on that of how you encourage people or, or help them to get out of that space? Well, I think it's just all focusing on the positive, like focusing on your own health. What do you know to be true right now? Like what is, what do you know to be true right now? I think that is the first and foremost thing. What is affecting you right now? What is in, what is in your reality? Not what you see on the media, not what you hear on the news, not what your, you know, aunt Sally is freaking out about, but what do you know to be true right now? Checking in with yourself, your reality. What is your senses saying to you? What is your body saying to you? How are you feeling? What's your, are you in a safe home? What's the situation? And for the most part, we can say, yeah, like, you know, all is good. Check all the good boxes. Everything, everything's good. So I know that, um, that that's the first step. And the second part is compartmentalization is to compartmentalize when you have to deal with what's happening in the news, or you need to catch up with what's happening in the world do that at a designated, or your thoughts are intruding upon your peace do that at a certain amount of time each day, like from 4 to 4.15 each day, 4 to 4.15 or 8 to 8.15 in the evening. Just take that time, journal, write, or just acknowledge, okay, you know, the thoughts that were coming up, what you need to deal with. So it's not intruding upon your entire day because that's when cortisol, the hormone cortisol starts to rob our peace. You know, and it says robs our peace and robs our calm, robs our joy. It is the thief that comes to steal. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I really believe that that can be cortisol when it's too much too long. And so that's something with managing that through compartmentalization, with managing, you know, our stress and focusing on the positive, we then empower oxytocin. Mm. You know, so we empower oxytocin, we feel more joy, we feel more peace, and then everything else, you know, no, God, it, it happens for a reason, right? It happens for a reason. You know, we may not know what that reason is for generations, but, you know, for right now, we just like take the good out of the situation as much as possible. Focus on the good in the situation. I love that. Um, and because for me, one of the things I did this a little before the pandemic, but I took off all alerts on my phone. So Facebook and, and LinkedIn, anything that had an alert. And I'm so free because all of a sudden I'm not uh, triggered into that dopamine checking, checking, checking. And if I want to go check Facebook or check LinkedIn or check my email, I can do that. But I get to do it when I want to, and my phone doesn't control me. And that's such a simple thing. If you guys haven't done that, I would encourage you to take the alerts off because it frees you. You are no longer a slave to those alerts telling you when you need to check in, then you can decide. And then if I want to check for, like she, like Dr. Kabaka said, a few um, minutes per day at a certain time, I can decide when I want to. And I've also found in the mornings, um, I used to be the person who's up at five, at 5.30, I'm at Orange Theory, like raising my cortisol. And last year I learned um, I really slowed down and I took some breaks in the morning where I just sit and meditate and pray and journal. It has changed my life. And what's the funniest thing for me is all of my 40 plus years, um, I mean, I've been normal weight, but I lost 8% body fat when I stopped working out. And it's, it's almost funny because I literally like, I'll do a few free weights. I have a pull-up bar back there. So I do some pull-ups and oh, I walk. Nice. <laughs> but I really like, I don't do near what I used to do. And it was all that cortisol, like you said, because cortisol will sabotage, cause weight gain around the middle and retention of fat. And to me here, I am in medicine. I know physiology. I was doing it all wrong for most of my years. And now that I sit and rest, my body's like, thank you. Uh, and then I go into the day more prepared and I'm more able, I don't know about you, um, Anna, but I find that I'm more able to respond to people in a way that um, I can meet them where they're at. Like something interrupts me instead of getting frustrated. I'm like, 
why did this happen? And is there something important here for me to learn? So I just love the new Jill. She's so much calmer <laughs> and a little bit more centered. Yeah. But I, and then just to take back control, because like you said, the news, I, from the beginning, I don't watch news anyway, but especially now, because it is going to be one of those drivers of fear and cortisol. It's meant to do that because guess what? When you have fear and cortisol together, it's addictive. And so they want to do a pattern that addicts you to turning on that news. And um, you, if you turn it off and you get to decide and regain your control, then you get to, to really control, like um, we talked about both cortisol and oxytocin. So thanks for sharing those tips. Um, That's so true. And then just back to that cortisol exercise activity cycle, you know, I wear the freestyle Libre, you know, I'm doing, wearing it again. I wore it for the last year in creating my recipes for Keto Green 16. Yeah. So the continuous glucose monitor. So I'm having a friendly conversation. So my blood sugar is nice and low. Awesome. <laughs> but if I was stressed out, it would be really, really high. And I think the same thing with exercise. We know that too, the fact that you lost 8% body fat was, I mean, it's just beautiful and built most likely increased your muscle because cortisol wasn't breaking it down. And we can think, oh no, I have to exercise more and eat less. And that's right. not the situation at all. It is, it is, it's like, and it's so much more than about food, the food we that's eat. That's exactly. Now. People think, oh, I got to restrict or I have to eat this or whatever. And I want to talk about what you are giving people freedom to do with your new book. But again, what I found is all the stuff I learned, I literally, since I've been in medical school, have been a six or seven day a week exerciser and pretty intense. It may not be long, like 30, 45 minutes, but I chose running and high intensity, things like orange theory, hit, hit types of stuff. And I thought that's what my body wanted. Like I actually craved it. But what I realized is not only was it tied to raising my cortisol, which I was basically in this cortisol addiction pattern, but what's funny, Dr. Kabaka, is I also learned that the old trauma response, the sympathetic overdrive, which is basically when we're in this all the time, we're in this fight or flight, and that's what we're used to from childhood, we naturally go there because it's comfortable and normal. And when we slow down and go into the parasympathetic, which is digest and reproduce and eat and relax, which is like me sitting there in the morning with my meditation or my prayer, um, all of a sudden our body will shift, the cortisol will lower. And if we haven't dealt with old emotions or old trauma or, or those kinds of things, it can be really uncomfortable. And I realized that it was almost like I had to do the work and do the therapy in order for me to slow down and be still. And now I can be still because I'm okay with being with myself in stillness. But if you find you're that type of person who go, you go, 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 and you actually have trouble sitting still, there might be something going on there. I learned that, um, you know, from personal experience. Oh, it's so, it's so true. And I love that you're sharing this because that's a reality. And for so many people, I'm sure that are listening that, that ebb and flow, like I need to be doing more or just sit and chill. And that's going to do more for my physiology than anything else. Like getting a full restorative night's sleep versus waking up and running to the gym because it's a to-do item, you know, and recognizing that there's a season for everything. There really is a season for everything. And we can probably both speak to that because I don't know about you, but I can confess openly here. I am a recovering workaholic, <laughs> so <laughs> I never drug or alcohol, but I always would like find my um, joy and, and feeling of being loved by achievement. And then I realized, wait a second, I, those aren't connected. So I lived a lot of my life just feeling like achievement was how I could um, earn my love. And then I was like, wait a second, this is this isn't right. In my end of my days, I'm not going to say, did I work harder? It's, was I connected and did I love people well? So, well, let's transition to your book because I know everybody's excited to hear um, about it. Tell us why you wrote this. Like, I, I know it's needed. You and I know it's needed, but I want to hear from you um, what you saw as a problem that this is solving because it's solving a big problem. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think the, the biggest thing is that absolutely. we've been led, <laughs> oh yeah, we've been led down a path of, um, you know, a lot of misinformation and disinformation, disease causing information, especially when it comes to nutrition mm -hmm. and how we should eat, how we should live and our, from lifestyle to the food we eat, but a lot of focus on the food we eat and that we can recognize now that there's a lot of poisons in the regular food that we eat. You go up and down those grocery store aisles and you can see carcinogens on the label, hormone disruptors on the labels, xenoestrogens on the labels. And that is something that, you know, we're 
um, we're not even made aware of. So number one, I wanted people to be aware and also eating by our physiologic design, especially in the menopause and beyond, so that we can breeze through menopause into our second spring, right? To enjoy a life of passion, strength painless, right? Pain-free with clear memory and expressions of joy and, enjoy, and enjoying the people we're with, the connections we're making and doing in the healthy way possible. So the Keto Green was in this, writing Keto Green 16, as well as the Hormone Fix, writing this was an act of love to enable everyone to have in their own hands this resource that will help empower their physiology by becoming insulin sensitive, mastering cortisol, getting control of cortisol and alkalinity, so that green aspect, not just in what we eat, but how we live, how we think, you know, what we drink, I mean, who we eat with, I mean, all those things we can can affect our physiology. So really being able to look at that and then empowering our most powerful hormone oxytocin. So building that into the pages of this book and Keto Green 16, building on the philosophy and the foundational book, The Hormone Fix, also with you know some recommended supplements, but a men's chapter two and bringing this in this 16 day plan as a plan that we can bring now into our virtual communities, into our virtual workspaces, into our Bible studies, into our home groups, Groups into our book clubs and in all these ways as a group we can do this together encourage each other in a healthy way and that's been missing for a long time and I think that's enabled us to have um, more susceptibility to illness we know that America is being hit really hard because of obesity hypertension diabetes and it's just a matter of, okay, we've created some unhealthy cell membranes. We need to heal them as quickly as possible. And with Keto Green 16, because it's like you say, like, uh, you know, eat the rainbow, right? Eating a rainbow food that are low carbohydrate and with fabulous, you know, um, you know, meats or proteins and healthy, healthy fats. We need fats for hormones and to do the intermittent fasting and to stop snacking. So especially with women going through menopause, because hot flashes is associated with insulin resistance, among other things, that doing it in this lifestyle, not just about what we eat, when we eat and, and when we don't eat, um, improves our physiology so quickly. I mean, it's beautiful what we're seeing in just 16 days. That's amazing because I know I've done like 30 day eliminations and stuff at 16. Mm -hmm. Sounds shorter, but I can totally see how you'd see a really great impact in that amount of time. And almost anyone listening is like, with 16 days, I can do anything for 16 days. Yeah. And yeah. then they like it, right? And they're like, I want to keep going. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, making changes and making discoveries. And for me, you know, I, I consider urine pH testing a vital sign. pH urine testing, whether it's pH and ketones, but definitely pH testing is another vital sign. It's like our temperature, right? It can tell us how well we're doing, how well we're managing stress. And it was an aha moment for me, Jill, when I found that um, cortisol increases the hydrogen ion secretion across the renal tubules, creating an acidic urine pH, which makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. So you can be eating perfectly like our vegan vegetarians eating these great organic plant-based foods, but still be acidic because you have too much stress and wow. just discovering what we need to do, like the meditation, mm -hmm. like the, you know, gratitude journaling, shifting our mindset to free us from toxic thoughts and um, can be a huge, a huge difference in our lives. So I love that because I'm a fan of, you mentioned your um, blood glucose monitoring and I have my aura ring, which monitors oh, my yes. variability and my sleep and all that. Um, but I think these are tools that people can get and they are all range of prices. You don't have to spend a lot of money. You can get apps on your phone to track your sleep. This ring is about $300. So not cheap, but also not out, out of the range of some people. Yeah. And then your glucose monitor, same thing. But pH strips are not that expensive. Pennies. Tell us just a little bit about what people would look for if they're testing and kind of the ranges of optimal acidic versus um, more alkaline. Yeah. So typically tell clients, I want them to be seven or greater, seven or greater. So just seven is neutral, but anything over seven is considered alkaline. And typically, you know, by the end of the 16 days, they're getting into the seven to eight range without trouble, waking up with alkaline, waking up alkaline and going to bed alkaline. That's really big for me. So that practice of doing that during the day when we're stressed or if we're dehydrated or we've just worked out, we're going to have some more of an acidic urine pH, but to pay 
pay attention when that's happening? And then what can you do to try to shift to be more alkaline during those times? And will the practice of meditation, will the practice of maybe more hydration before or after your workout shift your, shift your physiology or urine pH a little bit? So seven to eight, I mean, it's perfect, but I want them to average seven. So, so this is great information because again, it's a practical, very inexpensive way. People can get them from you, got, you on your website or yeah. you know, anywhere else anywhere. And, and do this themselves at home. It's not expensive. I love this idea. And I love the ability to basically make an intervention and then in real time, see how your intervention is affecting your physiology. So I think this is brilliant, Dr. <laughs> Anna. And I also want to say, just from my perspective, I deal with a lot of um, environmental toxicity, chronic infection and chronic illness and, and mold don't forget mold I mean, mold huge. for sure um, and the biggest thing my patients deal with in their detoxification process is staying alkaline because when they have a Herxheimer or die off reaction it's often because they're so acidic the enzymes stop working appropriately so from my perspective i can just say the liver and the whole biotransformation of phase one phase two excretion through the bile acids and just in general your kidneys and your lungs and your skin it works better at optimal pH. So this is actually really core. And, and what I do, my, I, I love that now I can give people your book because that makes a whole lot of sense to do in conjunction with the detox. But even more at the very basic level, I'll have people drink um, mineral water, getting more minerals or um, do things like Alka-Seltzer Gold, which is kind of a silly little old remedy, but it makes you body, your body more quickly alkaline when you're in a detox reaction. And so we've known for a long time that anything we can do to alkalinize the body, people will feel better in real time. They will feel better. They so. feel better and they feel more grounded. I'm glad you're doing that too. So you're having your clients check their urine pH during this and really optimizing it. Something we do too, like my, I call it my Mighty Maca alkalinizing elixir. It's the Mighty Maca, which has 30 superfoods, but with, um, um, some apple cider vinegar and a squirt of lemon. And if they're still acidic to add that baking soda, just some clean baking soda, just a little bit till you start kind of shifting. So you can get that feel, open up the detox pathways, help with the cell. You know, I really just a hundred percent see the improvement in, you know, cell cellular function, right? The decrease in inflammatory symptoms as a, as a positive symptom of that. This is huge because most of my patients who are on a detox protocol, especially mold, which is so toxic, the reason they get stuck is because that detox causes so much acidity and they get stuck because when the body becomes acidic, the enzymes who, that are helping the body get rid of toxins stop working. So at a certain pH level, they'll just stop or they'll decrease um, their effectiveness. So this is, a, this is so important across every illness, every disease. And clearly, like you said, back to even the virus nowadays, a lot of our patients who are obese, diabetic, heart disease, um, all of these, these metabolic issues are a disease of at the core, they're acidic diseases. Mm -hmm. So it's really mm -hmm. relevant. So tell someone kind of like practically speaking, what would a typical day in the life of Keto 16 look like? Like what are people eating on the diet? Uh, yeah, we have a great, we have a great app. It's at dranna.com forward slash keto calc, K-E-T-O-C-A-L-C, keto calc. So drana.com forward slash keto calc. And yeah, and that is a keto calculator to kind of look at based on your activity level, your age, and if you want to lose weight or gain weight, kind of what a, a keto green day would look like. So with just a regular three, you know, three meals during a keto green day. But with keto green 16, what we do is 16 hours intermittent fast. So from dinner to breakfast, but we work up. So for anyone who's new to intermittent fasting, start at 12. Go to 13, go to 14, go to 15, go to 16. Allow yourself that time and patience to work up to it so that we're not pushing our body. It is a marathon, not a sprint. We don't go lift, you know, deadlift 200 pounds or whatever, however much is a lot. Uh -huh. <laughs> Sounds like a lot, you know, a high amount of, of weight, you know, right, right out. We, we work our way up and the same with intermittent fasting and extended fasting. So that's really important. So a day in the life, I'll tell you yesterday I was doing a TV show. So I broke fast with a um, chicken, my curry chicken skillet recipe, which is on day two of my keto green 16 plants served over cauliflower rice mm -hmm. and topped with a cilantro coconut cream cashew sauce. So they put cashews in there, coconut cream, cilantro, and some lime, lime juice, and just added that over the chicken, the curry chicken and the um, coconut rice. I mean, the 
cauliflower rice and it was just amazing. So that's a break fast. That's a substantial break fast, like when we break fast. And then I had a keto green shake in between, which was just my keto green powder because I'm in so many uh, interviews. So just my keto green meal replacement powder with a couple scoops of Mighty Maca. I had that in between um, before I had dinner, which I, so I broke fast around 10 to 11 a.m. And then dinner at 6 p.m. with a keto green shake around 3 p.m. So, and we had our harvest beef stew. So it had kale and yeah. Uh, yeah, grass fed uh, ground beef with, you know, a beautiful stew, just a clear broth and some celery in there and just hearty vegetables and really just a delicious super dinner. And so that was dinner. And then water in between meals, not with meals so that we're not diluting our digestive enzymes. And um, yeah, that, that was primarily my day. Oh gosh, I'm salivating. That sounds so good. Yeah, I'm kind of <laughs> hungry right now because I just had a keto green shake so far today. <laughs> I love it. Um, do you like to cook? Is that something you enjoy doing? I do. I love to cook when it's not just for me. Yeah. I like to cook for every, now that all the girls are home, I love, I love to cook. I love when we're all cooking together and in the kitchen together. I love that. I love that. But in general, it's like, you know, I don't love prep work and I don't love cleanup work, but I love the creative part. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. That's like the ballerina part. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. It so is. You got to have that play part in yeah, there. Yeah, totally. Now, do you have four daughters? I have four daughters. Okay. Yeah. You met my middle one, Amira. Yeah. And then at the uh, last IFM, I think I met all, or almost all of them. They you were met, you met my two oldest ones. Okay. You met, um, well, oh, you met was, I don't think my littlest one was no, there, my 12 year old, but yeah, you met yeah. Uh, Brittany and Amanda too. Yeah. So you've met my girls. I love it. And what I love about you too, is you have this beautiful, beautiful family, beautiful daughters. They all clearly love and adore you. And it just, it speaks again to the authenticity of which you live life. And you do life and you're still a mom and you're still an inspiration to your daughters. And I love, I love seeing them like, here you are at your booth, you know, sharing your products and everything. And your, your family was there doing that with you. Like to me, that just speaks volumes of who you are. So Thank it was you. fun to see it. I think I took a photo with you guys. Like, I was like, I want to be with the cool bag of girls. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> so awesome. Um, well, someone else asked, let's see, what are some alkaline foods? Um, what foods? And I, I even have your little card here that you include. So I've got the cheat sheet. Yeah. <laughs> here, but I'd love to know, like, yeah, people are wondering what kind of things could they do to, besides the, the um, you said the apple cider vinegar with yeah. um, lemon in the morning yeah. with water. Yep. And so all the dark green leafies, all of those dark green leafies, and one of the most alkalinizing that I threw away for decades are beet greens. Ooh. So the greens, cut off the beet, yeah. wash those greens really, really well because they get sandy. Yeah. But those beet greens, Ooh. saute them in ghee with some onions, slivered onions, and add some lemon juice to take away the bitterness, and you will be alkaline. That is a powerful alkalinizing food. It is magic. Beet greens are magical. And and, um, and then kale, collard, like we're in the South, so collard greens, yeah. Swiss chard, uh, you know, and all your herbs and spices, parsley, cilantro, sprouts, mm -hmm. like broccoli sprouts, clover sprouts, a nice variety of sprouts are really beautiful and the cruciferous vegetables. Mm -hmm. So you're, and these are all low carbohydrate alkalinizers, fruit are alkalinizing for the most part too, but they're too high in sugar to be included in, in keto green with the exception of three key digestive fruits that I included in my program to add, as long as it doesn't kick you out of ketosis. What, what so, are those fruits? The, yeah, papaya, mm -hmm. uh, so good for digestion, right? Yep. Pain enzyme and um, pineapple, another, you know, very fabulous. And then mango. Okay. So, and they're not, you know, a little bit goes a long Garnish, way. Right? Like you'd see that on one of your chicken or salmon dishes, right? Like a little bit of, probably have it in your recipes. <laughs> oh yeah. And then just like, even uh, we have a mango coconut sorbet. So mostly like a full fat coconut milk, um, blend in some mangoes, blend that in and freeze it and just scoop it out and have that mango coconut sorbet. So that adds a nice um, finishing touch. And, and typically like that sweet, a little bit digestive enzyme that's sweet. We want that in the evening, typically in the evening meal. So that helps your body digest overnight and a little bit higher carb in the evening will also help increase serotonin yeah. and tryptophan so that we get that better night's sleep. 
Oh, I couldn't agree more because especially people who have adrenal um, HPA axis dysfunction and they tend to have a more flatline cortisol, um, I'll usually say you really want that protein and fat in the morning and then if you're going to have carbs, which you need it a little bit in the evening, just like you said, they'll tend to sleep better. If they don't, what happens I've seen with the um, people with HPA axis dysfunction is they'll be sleeping overnight and their blood sugar is not stable. It will drop middle of the night, 2, 3 a.m. Then their cortisol will rise up and they'll wake up wide awake because that cortisol spike because they're, when your body goes hypoglycemic or low sugar um, and it's not regulated with the keto uh, plan, then, then that cortisol will rise tend to wake you up. So a lot of times having that meal like you just described in the evening will prevent that and prevent that waking up at night. Absolutely. Exactly. And what are some other key things that you do for helping people get a good night's sleep? I want to hear what you do. Oh, yeah. So uh, I'm still, I'm like the classic OBGYN. I struggle with a good night's sleep. I do. Oh. I have my latest new, my new thing, which is my weighted blanket oh. by Zalm. Oh my God. I love it. It is. Me it is, too. I'm I've got helping. gravity, but same thing. Oh my gosh. A friend it's so funny because I have a friend who's like a naturopath and a, and a chiropractor and a, a physician and we'll get together sometimes and we'll always trade these fun biohacks. So the last time I went to dinner at her house, she's like, you've got to see what's in my bedroom on my, you know, uh, the king size weighted blanket. And that was the talk of the evening. I'm like, I want one of those. So oh, I yeah. love my, so if you guys haven't heard of the weighted blankets, what brand do you have, Dr. Anna? I have Zalm, X-A-L-M. Awesome. X-A-L-M. I love it. I know. It is so good. So that that is... And I have one called Gravity, but again, they're all kind of equivalent. Um, so helpful. So what this is, is a, is a weighted, mine's 20 pounds. If it's a king size, it might be up to like 25 or 30 pounds. Mine's a single. I have a king bed, but I just laid over my side of the bed. And um, it basically that weight uh, is almost like in utero or in the womb or even children with autism benefit because it yes. calms the nervous system. It's like this pressure, like being held by your mother or being in the womb. It tells your nervous system, hey, everything's okay. You can relax and go into sympathetic or parasympathetic state. And it's amazing. Um, other things, I have a routine every night um, that I take an Epsom salt bath. And I always do like, you know, the six pound Costco size bags. I do half a bag. So I do a lot of salt because I want that water saturated so that the gradient drives it into my tissues because that magnesium is calming. And it's also um, got the sulfate for detox. So you got this detox calming bath, great for muscle soreness. And I'll use a little lavender essential oil or eucalyptus in my bath. I'll have a cup of tea. And usually I listen to like a podcast that for me is relaxing or an audio book while I'm um, taking my bath. But that's kind of my ritual. Um, magnesium, so simple, but magnesium and glycine or glyc magnesium glycinate is really great for sleep. Um, I love, you mentioned um, increasing serotonin. We can actually give supplements like tryptophan and 5-HTP that will both increase serotonin and melatonin. Um, there's a small percentage of people that have an upregulated enzyme called IDO that will not react well to that, but it's a small percentage. And you'll know it because instead of sleeping peacefully, you'll be wide awake. So then you just stop it, no big deal. Um, there's other things like GABA you can take orally. And now there's so many liposomal formulations. Quicksilver has some really great ones yeah. that have either CBD or without the CBD, they have just GABA and theanine. Theanine is a great nutrient for those of you who have the brains that are going and it's a good kind of calm alert. It's also written in green tea, but some people like me who are, you know, like to think uh, at night, if I take theanine, my brain will keep going. So that might be a better daytime for those of you who are very um, cerebral in your brains. Um, and the ritual I think is so key because often we're on our screens or we just get off a phone call or we just watch a television show and then we expect our body to. So I think some sort of ritual, if you can incorporate a bath or a, you know some sort of ritual that gets you ready an hour before you're going to bed, you should shut off the screens, take your bath, uh, do your ritual because it prepares your body for sleep um, as well. I love that. Absolutely. I love all of the above. So, and I use a magnesium L3 and 8 combination yeah. with magnesium glycinate for bed and, um, and just these little, these little essential oils. So yeah. my favorites right now, um, bergamot, clary sage, and lavender. Oh, so just spraying that on my pillows when I remember at night too, just exactly right. I mean, at creating an evening ritual makes all the difference in, in the world too. And then something I teach in Keto Green 16, as well as the hormone fix is for those of us that, you know, have issues with getting up at night in the middle of the night to use the bathroom is just dry fasting after dinner, or just no more than four to six ounces of fluid after dinner. So your body is, you know, basking in its own digestive enzymes, and you're not having to get up in the middle of the night to pee. So 
Oh, I love that. Great advice. Yeah. Um, well, what, is there anything you'd like to leave? I want to really encourage people to go to your website, purchase your book, um, and I'll put links on our Facebook Live there. Um, but tell people where they can find your information. Like I said, I'll include a link. And then if there's anything you want to leave people with, I would love to end with some sort yeah. of, uh, yeah, encouragement. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jill. I mean, I can't wait till we speak together again. Oh my gosh. I mean, we have to, like, when will that happen? I know, right? Everything for the summer has been canceled. Everything's been yeah, IFM's yeah. canceled. Right. Paleo FX, KetoCon. I mean, oh my gosh. Okay. So at some point, I got to hug your neck again. I know. <laughs> um, so definitely my website, dranna.com. Join me there. And at dranna.com forward slash keto calc, you can get that keto calculator and that'll put you in our, you know, um, where you can buy our book in you know, the which you can buy it anywhere, Amazon, uh, Barnes and Nobles, Books a Million, your local book retailer. It's a Ballantine Penguin Random House publication. So anywhere books are sold. And then we have the book bonuses. So come back to our website and get the book bonuses. So, awesome. And I want to just leave listeners with uh, the fact that no matter what you're dealing with right now, no matter what you're exposed to, what you're dealing with, the stresses are strange. Just know that everything is like when we can sit, take a moment now and just sit in our space, know what we know to be true, just recognize what we know to be true right now and all the good that surrounds us in this moment. When we can focus on this, know that everything else is working for us for good. It is working for us for good. And some things may feel like a struggle and some things may feel hard, but just just discern what your next right step is and, and do it and do it and put a smile on and let's do it together. So that's my, that's my closing words, Jill. So thank you for oh, having that me. Is perfect. I don't even you. say anything else because I love it so much. Dr. Anna, thank you for your time. I can't wait to give you a hug in person and um, we will talk soon. I look forward to it. Thank you.